episode of On The Mic. I'm your host, Jake Killeen, and today we are joined by the 2017 Queensland PGA Champion, Daniel Pierce. Daniel also plays over in China on the Chinese tour and his home, home country, New Zealand. Uh, can't wait to talk some golf. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Yeah, pleasure. Good to be here. Mate, it's nice to chat to you. And since we've uh, seen each other, you've got two beautiful young girls. How, how old are they? Yeah, um, yeah, a couple of couple of little surprises. Uh, Lola's Lola's about three and uh, nearly three and a half. Oh, no, she's just gone three. Sorry, and Frankie's coming up twenty months. I think. Oh, sweet! So busy, right? Keeps you keeps you. Busy. Yeah, very busy. Yeah. And how's that affected your flat golf? Flat. I mean, how's that? Is it perspective on your golf changed, or you know, what have you sort of had to adjust while the two kids are coming into the world? Uh, yes, it's been quite a big change i guess with lola when we just had the one it wasn't so bad um yeah still was playing in china and playing a pretty full schedule over in aussie um but since having frankie um yeah lots changed really i guess um i was away quite a lot the first for probably the first couple of months after frankie was born and um yeah it was pretty hard on sarah so decided to she was born in October, 1st October 2018. Mm. So uh, start of 2019, kind of t- decided to take a step back from golf as much as I was playing, just play a bit of Aussie stuff and play a bit of stuff around New Zealand. So, And then again this year, probably another little bit of a step back as well, just playing a bit more around New Zealand and not, not as much in Aussie. So, Sure. Is that a long-term forecast? I mean, you want to, when the kids get a bit, a lot, a little bit older, are you going to go back and try and go full-time playing? Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm done with the game. I feel like I've got some unfinished business and um, believe it or not, my game's probably as good, if not better than it's probably ever been. And I'm hardly playing. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I hardly practice or yeah, anything, but, yeah, when I've been playing, I've still been playing some pretty good golf. Uh, it was frustrating, obviously, because you can't do things you used to be able to. And when pressure comes on, you don't quite handle it probably as good as you could But mm-hmm. at times. But, yeah, for the little practice I've done, my game definitely hasn't disappeared. So uh, definitely hoping to, um, whether it be next year or the year after, um, find a way to have another good crack before, before I definitely hang the boots up so is that a nice surprise to know that uh, all the work you've done in in your previous you know years have um allowed you to sort of not been able to practice every day and still had you know the sort of skeleton of, you, of your game and, and your swing yeah it, it has been actually pretty surprising you know, i thought um i had uh 2019 i had almost four months of three months three and a half four months without touching a club which is the first time for me and oh, I wouldn't know how long since I, probably since I started playing yeah. and hit, hit golf balls or done something. And I literally got back out. I was body was a bit stiff the first couple of times going back out, but yeah, other than that, no straight back into it, hitting it just as good and worked on a few things and was in it great again within a couple of weeks. So um, that's very interesting. Yeah, it was pretty su- yeah, it was pretty surprising. And since then, I, to be honest, I would have hardly spent any time on the range and not a lot of time practicing. And I'm still posting some pretty good numbers in little events around New Zealand. And I mean, I shot 10 under a, few, a couple of months ago in the second round of a pro am to win by a couple. So perfect. It's, yeah, it's, st- it's still all there. It's just trying to tap into it. Sure. Where, when do you think, where do you think the perspective comes from? I noticed that with a lot of golfers I speak to as well, the tour players who notice that um, if they put the clubs down for a while, it's still there. Um, where do you think the perception comes from in terms of not uh, thinking that you need to keep practicing and, and, and getting better and every day? Where, where do you think that comes from? Uh, I don't really know, to be honest. I guess it's just drilled into you when you're young that if you're, you're not practicing or you're not working hard at something, then you're not getting better. So everyone's just blood, sweat and tears to try and make the tiny, tiny little gains when I guess when you're young and well, younger, I'm still young, I guess, but, um, and you've got a lot of time on your hands. You've got no real other, you don't know any better unless someone's telling you, you don't really know any better and you feel like you've still so far away, but it's not until you actually, I guess, 
I mean, I've put a lot of a lot of hours in over the years, so sure, sure. I guess I've got a pretty good data data bank of memory in there stored away that now I can afford to not practice, I guess, as much and still had it okay. But yeah, yeah, it's um, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough one. Do you think it? Do you think it's uh, getting to know your own game? I think that that could be the key. I mean, as you said, you need a number of hours to understand your own swing your own game and then once you get the sort yeah, of understanding for sure no no yeah definitely um once once you know how you play and um where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are and so you can when you're not playing as much obviously try and play more within yourself i guess and not not try and push the push the limits or be too aggressive you just kind of plod your way around and you find you can still shoot as good if not better numbers when you're just taking it simply instead of trying to drive every green and <laughs> sure <laughs> but yeah more or yeah, less knowing your game and plotting the ball around and understanding that as well, yeah well it's so much i mean i'm the type of golfer that just tries to drive every green and then play play from there so but everyone's different yeah exactly so, well and also you're a big lad i mean well you're six foot four about 95 kilos yeah, something like that. So a big lad, and obviously as your game, you smash the driver. I mean, when I used to play with you, I know. You, I mean, you see this big, long, straight ball. I'm like, this guy's got it. <laughs> He's got it on a string. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's been a big key to your success so far in your career. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's always been the club I feel most comfortable with. Um, it's made me a lot more money than it's lost me. That's for sure. So yeah, for sure. And you know, you had a lot of natural talent when I got there. But t- talk me through your amateur stuff. So talk me through. You know, did you get a lot of help? Did you play a lot of golf? Um, do you see a coach? I mean, how how have you established your swing and your game since you're an amateur? Um, yeah, I guess when I was young, when I first got into it, I didn't start till I was about twelve, twelve or thirteen. And um, me and my brother used to both play rugby and cricket, just like most kids in New Zealand. And you know. <laughs> told mum and dad I didn't want to play either of them and I was going to play golf and they thought I was crazy. Dad, <laughs> dad was a pretty good rug, rugby player in his time. and It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, pretty much. And, and so then I, I, had to, I had to beg them to take me to the golf course. Right. So I just thought I was, I was going through some little phase, I guess. So and, what attracted you to the game? And what got you? I got no idea. Just always had a fascination for it. We had an old, just old five iron with probably a hickory shaft lying around at home. Yeah, yeah. I used to grab every now and then and go and whack the old ball with. And mm. I still can remember, where I must have only been oh, seven or eight, I guess. And I've hit this little, I've hit this, well, I found a ball somewhere, taken it out in the paddock and smacked it around a few times until I lost it. But I still remember this one shot I hit with it. It was a little, little draw. It probably only went about 80 metres. But to <laughs> me, that was like, that. I think from that shot there, I was hooked. Yeah. I was freaking, ever since then, I was like, I've got to play this game. And, yeah, finally got an opportunity to a few years later, and doesn't take much, does it, to get hooked? Nah, nah. And so then, yeah, mum and dad thought I was thought I was just mucking around with it, I think. Yep. And so it wasn't until I actually blew up at them one day and said, "Flip, if I was going to rugby or cricket practice, you'd da- take me off. You got to fr- why won't you take me to the golf course and let me go play?" <laughs> yeah, and they're like, "Oh shit, this kid's actually serious." Yeah, well, it's like, a bit <laughs> strange, right? Because I know parents these days are like, "Well, I don't want to have my kid in a contact sport, um, you know, injury or yeah. head head issues." So it's uh, a bit of a strange one that your parents are like, "Oh, he wants to play a safe sport," um, and. Yeah, so yeah. I guess that goes back to the culture of uh, New Zealand and rugby and uh, how important that sport yeah, is to you guys. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Obviously, you got really good pretty quick uh, being a late comer to the game. And then you got into um, some, some elite sort of teams in New Zealand. Yeah, um, I mean, I worked my ass off all through school and then just, just first year out of school, I got selected from a first New Zealand team. Um, Won a, uh, I think I won my first national title that same year, my first year out of school, an under-19s event in New Zealand, and then went over to Japan, played the World Junior Cup, um, and then, yeah, the next couple of years, played a few uh, Trans-Tasman Tro Cup, um, Four Nations Cup, played, yeah, quite a few, sent on quite a few pretty cool trips with New Zealand golf, so... Um, Looking back at it now, at the time, it didn't seem like it all seemed, it was awesome, but it just 
was life, I guess. But looking back at it now, I got some pretty amazing opportunities for a young fella and saw some pretty incredible places and all of it was paid for. So, yeah, you're pretty grateful for what you what you what I got to see and got to do and stuff, I guess. And then when you went from amateur to professional ranks, did you see a big change or shift um, in the level of competition or did you feel like you needed to come up to another level? Um, I mean... Yes, yes and no. I mean, I was playing some pretty good golf all through my amateur, um, all through my amateur stuff. Not probably like world class golf, I would say, but I had a lot of ability and could put some low numbers on the board. But yeah, I think definitely when I turned pro and kind of realised the seriousness of actually you have to play well consistently to play for money, like. I think there's a lot, a lot lost in amateur golf, and it certainly confuses me a little bit to why I stayed amateur for so long. I mean, I didn't turn pro till I was 24, um, and I, I wish I'd turned a lot earlier because I, I feel like I grew so much quicker as a golfer and as a player after turning professional, yep. oh. and I feel like my game developed so much quicker as well because all of a sudden, I mean, you played well, you got rewarded, whereas you could go play well in an amateur event and they might give you a, I don't know, a couple hundred dollar voucher or a toaster or a TV or something. And it doesn't really mean anything to you because like you don't have a house, you don't have, you got no, like yeah, exactly. all the stuff you get in, it doesn't really affect your life. But when you start actually getting checks for a thousand dollars or a couple of thousand dollars, you're like, holy shit, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, also, also the experience, right? Like, you know, as an amateur, that's a level, but to play with the big boys, as, as much as you feel like your game's ready or you can, you know you can do it, still competing at that different level is a different mindset and, um, and it's easy to get into a different mindset, isn't it? So that's all experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, that, I, I felt like my game really grew, grew uh, and grew pretty quickly when I first turned pro. I still had a lot of learning to do, um, but I wish, I'd, I wish I'd had a go three or four years earlier. Um, hindsight is a, good, is, a, is a good thing to have but you know in a way could it have also helped you be more ready being that long I understand uh, yeah, also- I could have I mean, I mean my time in Melbourne when I came over to Melbourne for those couple of years was invaluable and I learned a lot of good lessons over there and played some amazing golf courses and I think playing pennant in Melbourne like we were playing some top level golf courses against top level competition and although it's match play it's still you're going out there with the mindset you have to win. You have to make birdies, sort of thing. So, I think that was that was great for my golf as well. And I took a lot. I made, got a lot of confidence out of that. I mean, I think I played fourteen matches and won twelve of them. So, um, perfect. That playing, yeah. So uh, that that gave me a lot of confidence going forward as well. I guess, um, yeah. In terms of your own game, um, so how do you keep? An, you know, you spoke about when you. Uh, left the game for a while for a few months and came back. There was a few little things you had to, had to tidy up. What what are those sort of things in your game that you that sort of goes away and you have to tidy up as you come back? What what are those things you you're talking about? Uh, just oh, just getting comfortable over the ball again. I guess as you said, I'm a tall fella, so um, it's my back. I've had and I've had I've had a few issues with my back over the years, so it's just getting the body used to hitting the ball again. Just trying to find that rhythm again and do you watch for anything like a setup or do you sort of look for anything particularly um, anymore or literally you just find the feel and, and the strike yeah a little bit of setup a little bit of making sure i'm set up properly and yeah to be honest i don't i don't think about a lot to be honest anymore i just kind of how do you get to that point did you have a lot of help or did you do, figure it out all yourself or uh, yeah, I've had a few different coaches over the years. Um, I mean, did a bit. Of, you helped me out there for a while when I was in Melbourne, and I've had a few guys have input. I've well, had a lot of guys have input into my game. Um, but yeah, my first years as a pro, I was working with a coach here um, in New Zealand, Marcus Wheelhouse, who's obviously done some pretty good stuff with New Zealand's top golfer at the moment, Ryan Fox, um, and he's his coach and whatnot now. And, mm. But the last couple of years, um. I've gone back to working with um, my first coach, well, the guy I was working with when I first kind of made New Zealand teams, a guy called uh, David Dorkwe. So he's based out of Shenzhen in China. Um, and I started catching up with him again. He was a good mate of mine when I first left school and 
I was working with him when I first made my New Zealand squads and stuff um, back just out of school there. And uh, so we were catching up a little bit when I was going up and playing in China and um, I wasn't playing overly well. So I was just like, dude, you mind having a look and give me a few pointers? And he's like, yeah, sure thing. Um, and then I went away and I think it was about a, well, three or four weeks after that, I had top five, finished fifth at the Fiji International. Um, so that's still to date probably my biggest paycheck and probably best result, top five in a European tour event. So, um, that's awesome. And yeah, I just felt the, the things I was, that David said were really, like, just really struck home to me and I kind of walked away feeling really good after that and so yeah it was probably another oh, six months or so after that I finally decided to leave Marcus and started working with Dave again so I mean we don't me and Dave don't do a lot of I've caught up with him a couple of times in China and then um, he ca he's come down here once to see me and we don't spend a lot of time together but this the stuff I know we've got a really good relationship from the years previous and we all we talk regularly but um I find his stuff just really simple and he knows me and it just, yeah, it, I don't know. Everything just feels a lot easier than it used to. I guess I'm not so much timing reliant, I guess, mm -hmm. anymore. And I just use my, I don't know. It just seems easier well, than what, it used to. Well, you, you alluded to a couple of little things he gave you and you finished top five. Yeah. And what, can yeah. you give us an idea of what that was? What was it that he's just, just starting to use my legs a little bit better. I've always kind of not, I guess my legs haven't worked. I've always probably been more of an armsy swinger, I guess, and quite timing reliant. Um, and so it was just getting my legs a little bit more active and then just getting my arms and body kind of working together better. So it just kind of takes all that reliance and timing out and you're just swinging the club. Instead of having to time it, you're just kind of letting your body, your body movements, I guess, do the work. Well, I want to touch on the the win you had in the Queensland uh, PGA, and that was a fantastic win, mate. So congrats on that. Um, but Thank it was you. interesting because you you certainly had a bit of a lead going into that last round. So yeah, <laughs> I want to certainly did. <laughs> I want to talk to you. But I mean, I think it's a uh, um, there's some negatives and positives you can bring out of that because um, you birdied the first hole and you had I think an eight shot lead at that time yeah i think no, i think i had nine shots nine shot lead so uh yeah. talk us through uh basically the start of the round how you felt and then obviously the lead up to burning the first having nine shot lead and then winning eventually in a playoff yeah she was a she was a bit of a strange one that day um i mean obviously the first three rounds i was playing some pretty good golf i went over there pretty relaxed yeah um it was three weeks or four weeks after Lola was our first daughter was born. Right. Um, and I just finished 11th the week before at the New Zealand open. So that's my, that was my best finish in the New Zealand open. And I'd made a pretty decent check there. And I, so I was feeling pretty good about life. And um, I wasn't actually going to play that event. I hadn't because obviously Lola had just been born and things were pretty hectic at home, but I was talking to one of the, well, I was talking to Ryan Fox actually, and he was like, "Dude, if I can win at that, if I can win there, you can win there. Easy, just go over and play. You're playing good. You might as well." And, and then obviously when we finished eleventh at New Zealand Open, flew over, played that. I literally I turned up probably half an hour before my first three tee times. Went to the net, hit fifteen <laughs> balls, went onto the putting green, hit five or six putts, and walked to the first tee. Wow. Yeah, and it worked. I mean, I did it the first day and I went all right. So I did it the second day, went all right. So I was like, well, I can't change it now. <laughs> That's so <right. laughs> That's right. the third day, I think I shot eight under in the third round to go to 21 under through three rounds. Oh, wow, like, man. That's unbelievable scoring. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the last round, um, I mean, still felt, well, I, mean, I was relaxed. I felt great. I knew I was playing well. I was putted. I putted unbelievably the first three days. I mean, I just couldn't miss. Um, and yeah, I felt pretty good all day to be honest. I hit, I had three bogeys in a row in the middle of the front nine. I think it was four, five, six, seven. The first two, I didn't feel like I played either hole that bad. I slightly, I first, first bogey, I've hit perfect drive. It's clipped this overhanging tree. 
and it's kicked it like 25 meters straight left directly behind the tree like this big gum tree and i had to chip out sideways didn't get it up and down so i was like well it's just unlucky That's like got- i've crushed a drive down the middle yeah. and i've just got unlucky yeah, yeah, uh, yeah i mean if it had missed a tree it would have been 10 meters off the front edge of the green <laughs> um next tile i've had it slightly blocked it i had a shot had 50 meters off an upslope just had to flop it over this tree pretty much and it's come out like low and fizzing off a bit of a sandy lie straight into the bush, chipped it out and made it good up and down for bogey. I was like, oh, that's pretty unlucky as well. Yeah. Like, every day of the week, I mean, I had an easy shot. Every day of the week, I would have thrown that over the tree onto the green sort of thing. So how was your mental and, state then? So were you still st- staying patient or were you looking leaderboard? Yeah, look, I mean, I still had like a, a sort of six or seven yeah, right in front, right. so I wasn't really worried. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and the next hole I made, the next hole was a nervy bogey. Like I've had bombed a drive down the middle, had 40 yards to the green, had a bit of an average pitch shot and then three putted. That was, that was all just pure nerve. I just, yeah, was a bit nervous on that one. Right. And I was starting to get a bit flustered then. And then I've had a horrendous shot on the next par three and actually made a really good up and down for par out of the front trap. It's only like a 130 meter par three. So this pretty shit shot <laughs> in the bunker. Yeah. And I think, Matt Miller and the other dude I'm playing with some couple over now and the two of the guys I was playing with were like five or six under through nine and one of those was Matt uh, Miller was it the, yeah right and so we're tied on the tied standing on the 10th tee and I'm like wow that that, <laughs> that happened quick <laughs> yeah. I haven't lost nine shots or eight shots that quick before so it, but anyway yeah, yeah I mean I've I wasn't too worried. I still knew I was playing well and I had a massive, pretty big advantage over both the guys because they weren't the longest hitters. So I was just like, if I just keep playing my game, playing the way I have been, just be patient. Yeah. And I've hit really good. I've absolutely ripped one up the 10th hole. Short par five uphill. I've probably hit it 100 past both the guys I was playing <laughs> with. Um, yeah. Hit gap, hit gap wedge in and I've hit it to like a foot behind the hole. It must have, it must have, it was coming back like spinning back in it's just stopped short right i've tapped that in for eagle i think they both made par maybe so that gave you a bit more confidence then Not and so i had a couple this so i went back to a couple in front and then i've parred the next and they've both made bogey so i was back to three in front so i was pretty pretty yeah. relaxed again and i actually played really good for the rest of the um for the rest of the, the rest of the holes i played some really nice golf i just didn't hold a putt um, had some good opportunities, just couldn't make one. Get, couldn't get one to go in. And then eighteen. It's a tricky little hole. I don't know if you've played to one, but it's a good little finishing hole. It's downhill par four. There's a creek in front of the um, front of the green, a two tier green, and a few bunkers around it and stuff. Um, and I was just like, I've just got to get in place. I've tried it at three iron down there, leaked it a bit right into a fairway trap. I think I've had six iron in and I've pulled that into the left green side trap to a back pin um, and I didn't get up and down and, and I think me and Matt were tired. He'd, Matt had made a few birdies to get back to mm. tied so we were tied playing the last um, and then yeah so we both bogeyed the last anyway to finish 19 under or whatever. And so I was like, oh, well, I mean, I could have lost it, but I didn't. <laughs> right, right. But so I've st- still got a chance. So I was like, oh. So yeah, a couple of playoff holes later and managed to get it done. Nice, mate. Nice. Well, that would have been a pretty emotional time, that was for sure. Were you more relieved than anything or excited? How, how was your emotions after it? Uh, I was pretty stoked. I mean, yeah, it was yeah. a bit of relief as well. Like yeah, it was, yeah. I, was, I felt like I'd, I mean, I, I thought the first playoff hole, I'd, I was done. Yeah. Um, where where I hit the tee shot, and then, I mean, I was, I got lucky. I got a swing, and then I got lucky that I managed to pull the shot off that I needed to hit. Um, well, not lucky. I mean, I I just I managed to pull the shot off. Um, what was, yeah. what what did you learn most out of it? Then was it the patience part? Um, being able to get yourself refocused. Wh- which part did you learn the most out of that? Uh, I guess just knowing that I could win, even though when I wasn't playing well. I mean, I shot two over in the last round and still managed to win the tournament. So, um, I mean, I obviously set myself up in a good, pretty good position through the first three rounds. But 
just knowing that even if I didn't have my best, I could still get it done. Yeah, was cool. Pretty... Yeah, you must have been proud of yourself being able to sort of refocus after losing nine shots in you know nine or ten holes. And yeah, I mean that was that that, that could have really been a make or break point that to that turn. But I, I stood on the tenth tee, probably feeling more confident mm. and more excited than ever having a golf tournament. So yeah, you're I right. Mean, you, yeah, I mean it, as much as I could have been standing on the tenth tee with a seven eight shot lead. You always want to go into the back nine on Sunday with a chance to win, and, and I had a, I still had a chance. So I guess that's probably, for me, that attitude, just have, being able to have a, an attitude where I was calm enough to still realise that. and Enjoy the moment. Still, yeah, and, and just be excited and hungry about the moment was probably, I think, probably the reason I won. I, oh, well, not the reason I won, but it just allowed me to, relax and play some better golf on the on the back so that's line, interesting so. you talk about attitude mindset uh, that's very interesting at your level where your skill level is quite high but to, to get over the line and to do well it's it's you're, you're yeah, alluding to. i mean oh all, all my wins i haven't had a lot but i've had a few um around new zealand and whatnot all of them have been the weeks where my attitude and mindset and everything's been good i mean my game's good enough week in week out and and I just, I've struggled at times just with um, the amount of pressure I put on myself and trying too hard. And then obviously, um, yeah, just kind of, no, I wouldn't say self imploding, but just beating myself up to a point where you, you stop allowing yourself to play good golf. So how do you work on that? Did you, do you go through a pressure routine? Is there a process you go to? How do you work on that part of the game? Uh, I think for me, I think for me, yeah, there is, there's obviously the, all that sort of stuff you can do and you can go and work with people. But I think for me, it's probably more been uh, just getting things outside of golf in a better place as well and being happy in myself. Um, and golf, I guess, because you can't just walk around every day slamming your clubs and yelling and swearing <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> Because people are going to think you're crazy, but on the golf course, you seem to be able to do it and get away with it. So, um, <laughs> well, not get away with it, but people are just like, oh, he's, he's having a bad day. He's not playing that well today. But I mean, golf is a great outlet for all life, I guess, in a way. You I mean, shit can be going home, wrong at home or just anywhere. And you get on the golf course and you can just let it out because people are like, oh, he's just having a bad day. And I guess for me, as long as everything, at, like if I can be happy in myself, then it's a lot easier to play good golf. After that win, you reached 422, I think, in the world. So I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but um, that's a yeah, pretty good, you know, it's a pretty good effort, mate, to get inside the, you know, 450 in the world. How did you feel about that achievement? Yeah, I was pretty stoked. Um, I was, yeah, it was pretty cool to know that, I mean, I hadn't really played on any big tours yet and I was able to achieve that so it just gave me hope if I did manage to get onto a bigger tour that I was heading in the right direction and I mean my game's yeah my game's there my game's well suited for any tour in the world really it's just trying to get on those tours it's very challenging having a world ranking um how is that how is that important in terms of your status and how you get starts yeah, I guess if you if you're getting up there in the world rankings and you don't really you're not really playing on a main tour, you never know who's going to notice it and pick you up through that. Like you might get signed by a management company or someone might be like, well, give this guy a shot and get him some starts and events sort of thing. Or I think other than that, you've got to be in the top hundred in the world to kind of get a category. I think to get any real help other sure. than that, I think. What, what's your goal then? What, it, would you want to get yourself on the PJ Tour or a European Tour? What's, where, where do you want to see yourself play or with your family? Uh, if, if all things going well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have a crack on the PJ Tour one day. But um, if we stay in New Zealand, I'll be looking probably more towards Japan. I mean, I had a couple of cracks at, I've had a couple of cracks in Japan already um, at going to Q school and uh, first time I went up there, just, just missed out at final stage, got through second, third, and then um, six rounds of final stage. Uh, yeah, didn't quite get it done. Um, and then the next year, I missed by a shot at third stage on getting back to final stage. 
and I've had a crack over in America at the final stage of web.com. So I've had a couple of opportunities already, but just haven't quite capitalized. Yeah. Well, good experience. Them, um, good experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you go and play in those events and you see some of the guys playing there. And I mean, I, th- I think I played with Fernando Castaño Gonzalez, the Spanish dude at the final stage of web.com tour. And I mean, I, I don't think I've had a, seen a guy hit as irons as good as this guy did, but I've never seen someone hit drivers bad either. So <laughs> you can see why he had won European tour events and stuff and um, um, and why he's such a good player. But then, he's, yeah. So you're playing with guys like that and you're just like, your game's there. It's just it's just having the, a good, like, it's just so hard getting on a tour. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people understand how hard it is to get onto a onto a golf tour. I mean, it's unless you get, unless you get an invite or you get like a co-sanctioned event and you manage to win that, or you're just going nuts and winning everything you're playing in, and someone's like, "We need to get this guy some starts somewhere." It's so hard to to get onto a, like this. I mean, you turn up at. Um, Japan tour school and you've got nearly 200 guys playing for 25 or 30 spots yeah and they're not they're, and they're not bad goal and every single one of those golfers every single one of those 200 are good enough to, to make the top 30 and the golf courses over there aren't easy and I mean same in America you turn up at final stage over there and it's a similar thing it might even be more than that cup it plays over a couple of courses so you've got 250 odd guys 300 guys playing for 35 spots or whatever it is it's yeah those lowest ones work. i've seen some of those scores mate at tour score it's just crazy low yeah like so. i mean we play over when i played the web.com we played uh at pga national so the um where they play the honda the honda classic on the pga tour so we played two rounds on the, the course they play that on and two rounds on the other course and it was windy and it wasn't easy and the scoring was still i mean i the scoring wasn't great because it's obviously a pretty challenging course, but the scoring was still pretty good. Like I, won, I think the winner shot about twenty under or something for for four rounds. Yeah, so it's pretty pretty phenomenal golf around those golf courses. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And who's the best player you've played with? Then you, you alluded to Gonzalez, but who's the best player you've seen? Uh, <sighs> played with a lot of older Aussie guys like Peter Senior and um, guys like that, which is pretty cool playing with those guys. Seeing what they've done and how they've done it and um, the records and stuff that they have and the amount of wins and stuff they've had. It's pretty, pretty impressive. A lot of, a lot of the older, older Aussie guys I've played with. Did you get in their heads or did you ask them questions or anything? Or uh, A little bit, a little bit. Um, but no, I mean, when you're playing a golf tournament, you don't really want to, oh, I don't I've, I'm generally so focused in my own head. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I've been Peter. Peter, an awesome guy. I've, I've met him. I used to do some work up at Hope Island, and that's where he's a member. Yeah. But he's a silent killer on the course, and when he hits balls and to do with golf, yeah. like he is a killer. You know, like here. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. any any time outside, he's just a he's a lovely guy. But um, yeah, it's amazing when he steps in the ropes. Um, the golf is just he's yeah, still playing crazy good at his age as well. Well, uh, I've got a couple of uh, small sort of one answered questions for you to finish. Um, basically, I want to know who your golfing idol is. Who, what, who is it? Who was it? Uh, I guess when I was first getting into the game was when Tiger was kind of yeah. just tearing shreds off everyone and <laughs> the goat. everyone was scared of him. And so it's, it's hard not to say him. I mean, mm, mm. yeah. I mean, I, I love the way Adam Scott swings the golf club. Yeah. Um, and then I, I also really like the way Dustin plays the game and guys like that. But yeah, my the reason I probably started play got wow well, as passionate about golf was just watching Tiger dominate and yeah. thinking I could emulate that sort of thing. I guess. Yeah, I don't think the younger generation. I think we're lucky. I mean, I'm 35, and you're what are you 31 or something? Um, yeah, 31. Yeah. I don't think they understood how good the guy was. Even looking at the yeah. record, like yeah. I remember, he would tap in five foot putts. Like literally, yeah. he could not miss a putt inside five six feet. And just yeah. if he got in trouble, he was out of trouble. <laughs> yeah, that, those those early years when he, first, I mean, he was changing that many that much shit with his swing weekend with like just always searching for something he was playing unbelievable golf but just seemed to be changing his swing and still playing good it was 
pretty uh, pretty stupid in my opinions, but um, but yeah, so just his domination, I guess. Mm. When I was first beginning, was probably what really got me excited and passionate about the game. I guess. Yeah, his ability to make a part when it mattered or hit a shot when it oh, mattered it was just yeah. crazy good. And the, just the iron shots he'd hit, and mm. like just, just, just stump. Like when he needed to, he just hit it to a foot. Yeah. Like, how, yeah, exactly. How can you do that? There's like a couple hundred thousand people <laughs> watching you. Yeah, the, yeah, I mean, millions you, of people. You need to them. hit a, you need to hit a good shot, and you just hit it to a foot. Or well, just some of the shots he had, and just yeah, it was just. Mm, I remember that part. I remember I was uh, late for school one day. I think it was about, I think it was '98. Was it the U.S. Open or the PGA? I think it was the PGA up against Bob May. I don't know if you remember that. Maybe it was '99. I can't quite no. remember. But he had like a left to right downhill fast putt, about four or five feet to keep the playoff going or to to get into a playoff with him. And I, yeah. I've, there's no way in the world you could make that putt. Like, yeah, the pressure of that, there's, you know. There's another one. The other one that um, I think it's the might have been Arnie's tournament. I think he holds his 15 footer left to right. I think it's like downhill sloping putt on the screen. It's just like that's, you just don't hold that putt. Yeah, is and that when he threw his hat? Like, is that when he threw his hat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's won eight yeah, times there. Or something. <laughs> Mate. it's just like you just don't hold that part that's not a part you hold when you need to hold it and it's just yeah just shit like that yeah. yeah some of those things he did were phenomenal he loves that green i think he's won three times on that green with one part <laughs> so, yeah um all-time favorite foursome if you could choose Ooh, it's a tough one probably have to be tiger Tiger, Jack, Jack Nicholas, and I would have loved to have played with Sevi. I'm free, mate. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, 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 Sevi. Yeah, Sevi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sevi. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't. I to be honest, I didn't know a lot about Sevi's um, prowess and records in the game. I knew he was good, but obviously he died probably and was probably a bit before my time playing. But uh, just. Just well, over the last year or so, I've looked into his stuff a bit more, and the guy was seriously good. I think over 50 phenomenal. wins, right, on the European tour? Yeah, I, yeah, most wins, still most wins ever on the European tour, 50 wins. and Crazy, man. Just the places and things he used to do with the golf ball were pretty phenomenal back in those times. So, yeah. yeah, and the the way that people of his generation talk about him too, um, it's, it's almost like he was a god to them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we uh, we definitely miss that. Uh, I think we've been lucky. We've had MJ and Tiger, and yeah. you know, yeah, I think yeah. we've been pretty lucky this yeah, generation. But I think yeah. yeah, it would have been nice to see Seve in his day for sure. Yeah, um, best advice you've been uh, told or had from someone for golf? Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah, I'm sure there's a few. Or best advice you can give based on what you know then? Um, just believe in yourself, really. I mean, if no one's golf is such a challenging game at the best of times. Um, and it's so, so in your head that if you can just believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing, and it makes life so much easier. Yeah. Do, do you, th yeah. Do you think people uh, get too much advice sometimes and, uh, you know, don't look into the... Yeah, I think so a little bit. I think there's... People rely on others too much to be able to yeah. fix them. And mm. I mean, you've got to know your own game. Is, I think that's knowing yourself and knowing your own game and knowing what makes you tick. Is, um, Great you, I mean, when you're out there playing or out there traveling, you, your coach isn't there or your people, your, your team as such isn't there as much as today, I guess, they are in a way because it's easy to have a video chat like this or call someone but mm. you've got to you've got to know you've got to know what you're doing and you've got to be able to fix yourself and you've got to be you've just got to believe in yourself that i think is probably the biggest thing in golf you've got to believe that what you're doing is right and what you're doing you can win with regardless of what's going on so nice mate that's that's really good advice um also the last one uh what would be the your ultimate achievement in golf so if you could name one thing, what would it, would that be? 
Ooh. Don't limit yourself, mate. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my ultimate goal in golf, I, I'd love to tee it up in the Masters. Yep. Um, yeah, awesome. I mean, I'd love to win that. I'd love to win that title too. But just, just even mm. getting get into the position where I've played well enough to get an invite to that event would be. I reckon your game suited to that course as well. Yeah, I reckon I go. I'd, licking uh, that up, licking the chops. I'd like my chances. Well, I wouldn't like my chances, but I'd like. I'd just like to get a go there. Eh? Um, yeah, it looks phenomenal. Have, yeah, what? You, have, you wouldn't have been there. Have you even to watch it? Have you been? No, nah, nah, I've kind of always said if I, unless I, well, I guess you can't go unless you're invited. Yeah. But I'd never go just to watch. Um, you wouldn't? I, I don't. Nah. Really? Nah. Not interested? No, nah, I couldn't, couldn't do it. No, no, nah, nah, I'm not a big. I mean, I don't mind watching golf a little bit, but I hate. I hate. I, mean, I don't mind watching it on TV where yeah, you can sure. kind of they just flick through the good shit, but I hate wandering around a golf course. Even the Masters, play. mate. That's that's incredible. Yeah. No, nah, I mean, that's always. Enough. You'd rather play that's it. Kind of, yeah, that's something I've always said to myself. Unless I'm playing, I'll never go there. So. Yeah, fair enough. I like it. Um, mate, uh, wrapping up, any, uh, is there any way we could sort of see your progress or when you get back out there, do you have a, a website or Facebook? Do you do any of that or? No, I, th- I throw, I generally put all my results up. Wow. Well, if I've had a win or anything, I'll post it on Facebook or Instagram yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, cool. Daniel Pierce. Yeah. Just, I think Instagram's Daniel Pierce 27 and then just Daniel Pierce on Facebook. So no worries. Any other shout outs you want to do or anything like that, mate, while we're here? Oh, I mean, Titleist, Titleist have always looked after me with gear. They've been good to me. Pin Hive, uh, they always give me shirts to wear. So um, I've got a good mate here in New Zealand, Peter Ranford, who um, has got a company called Fine Tune Putters and Boom Golf, a couple of companies there. He's, he's been really good to me um, and makes some fantastic putters if you're in the market for a custom putter. And um, had some pretty good had some pretty good results with his gear. And then obviously just my coach, Dave, Dave Nortquay up in China. Mate, I really appreciate your time. It's been great to catch up with you and um, I really I really enjoyed our chat. Good luck with the kids and say hello to Sarah for me. Yeah, we'll do. Cheers, mate.